I would like to introduce to you poet Michael R. Brown. Born in Pennsylvania, living in different parts of the United States. When he moved to Chicago, he joined the slam poetry scene there. Later, he brought it to Massachusetts as founder of the Boston slam scene with Patricia Smith. He hosted at the Cantab Poetry Slam and Open Mic for many years and built an extraordinary, vibrant community there that carries on. And I recommend that you go to Cambridge and see what it's all about. Eventually, he moved north to Maine and now lives in Robinston. He is editor of Off the Coast Poetry Journal with partner Valerie Lawson here today. He is also president of the board and works at Stage East, a local theater company in Maine. A natural born teacher believing all people are good. He works from that perspective in his outreach and connection for a good part of his life. From working in public education to teaching on reservations to teaching at college and beyond, even as host of poetry at Kentab. Presently, he's working on a book about American education, which we look forward to. He hosts a monthly poetry reading with Valerie in Maine now, and has four books of poetry published. He'll be reading in Brockton later today with Valerie as well. And now I would like to give invite you to give a big hand, uh, a big welcoming hand from far north in Robinston here with us today, and we're very grateful to have you here. A hand please for Michael R. Brown. This week just had wheezed that powers the fever up my face and into my head is like a dry wood boiler generating steam, propelling me through month-long thickets of experience, whirring by in cacophonies of rich fall color strewn on plush turf. Brilliant sunfits crown my head like a torturer's hat, blinded without, blinding within, shattering my vision so that each step bumps the dark tunnel's end of the kaleidoscope, which is my sight. The taste of leaves is smoke. The smell of smoke dilates my nostrils. The warm air flumes and mixes dead wood and dry grass, dirt and onion leaves, broad leathery base of pine, fish on sea air into a great autumnal chowder boiling inside my head above the hearth fire in my chest, my stocky legs sturdy on the stone floor, my stumpy arms hooked for hanging things, my crazed consciousness a woodman's cookbook, and my sad congested heart singing like a stone at the center of the cauldron. For all of the cacophonies of nature's weird music, I gather in quiet writing while my senses are dragged behind Fall's runaway cart, and I wish, I wish I declare if I were half my age and twice as mad as all of the music of the world played at once, I would be you, John Keats. I would be you. I want to go to Chicago town. I want to go to the fair. I want to go to Chicago town. All of my Friends are there. This mellow sense of longing feels like a muted trumpet solo late at night. Golden notes on an ornamental chain wound round a sinuous African waist. Miles' eyes gleaming brighter than his horn, bleeding intelligent love, tortured soul. His dexterity a dance, a string of fiery arabesques, chasing sad feelings of a song too soon gone. Long after the circus has bedded down for the night on silk golden straw, the tightrope walker returns to the tent. A long blue note eases out from the platform, slides a toe on the wire, and rubs it back and forth, resinous squeak vibrating the line on which his melody will advance. A tentative cluster edges ahead on a weighty dare, a chance, a change, an invitation to himself to step on air as vibrant as the wire, holding up the complete loss of gravity except for one point where human pain and foolish emotion replay in remembrance of weightlessness, make him dance, 
wow on the wire above the pale floor. At midline, he jumps, slides, flips, and turns exuberant painful figures in the air. Each move, a tightly wrapped convolution twirled in dark space like a Christmas ornament. Colorful recreation, giving back bright flash from a dark soul. All of it spins around the ear, that gyroscope of balance and harmony, indispensable rightness of sure step and true note. The ear, air master, place fixer, music conductor, holding the center of this muted nighttime Walenda, doing impossible tricks of his own device to cure his soul of the pain of longing, just so he can make it to the other end of the wire slide down the rope, walk out of the tent, catch the dawn, and never repeat the chorus in exactly the same way. Everybody knows him as old folks. Like the seasons, he comes and he goes. Just as free as a bird, just as good as his word. That's why we all love him so. While my father strutted ghost-like on the broad ramparts of his life, his greatest truths lurked in dark corners. The more he thought he knew what was around, the more realities scurried along the edges, quick, furtive things he could only guess at. In his last days, my father saw farmers move in weird dances where only corn shocks stood. He dodged imaginary slaps and cars that never came down the street. He talked to people across the room as if they came from different worlds. I walk into the VA hospital every Monday and stare my future in the face. Ashy old men shuffle past in frayed plaid robes, cigarettes burning down to yellowed knuckles. They mumble meaningless conversations with absent passers-by in vacant hallways. Someday, I'm going to be a shambling phantom in an unfurnished future. I fear the loss of fire, but the nurses tell me that drugged and alcoholed, these men never felt the rage to dare life's tightropes. Still, I get an attitude about the broad daylight truths that scare us into doing right, while the tough facts of life gnaw away at the foundations, pick at the threads on the frayed plaid robes until we stand naked in front of our graves, wondering, how did we come to this? Someday there's going to be no more old folks. What a lonesome old town this will be. Children's voices at play will be still for a day. The day they take old folks away. In my earliest memories, my mother's wash stick rattled up my back while I twisted in her other hand held high. We've settled how her bike stalled, and she found me soundless, my ankle mangled in the spokes. But when she's finally gone, it's her last heroic days I'm going to remember. Discovering a tumor is stumbling on a fissioning mass of disorderly cells. We deploy the masters of war, train every weapon on a target, send painful patrols to bayonet the bad cells. She had a stroke on the table, but like a good gunnery crew, they held her in place and kept her pumping. But she had to sell the house. And she sat through the auction, her silver hair a halo, her hawk-like eyes bright, the entire household turned inside out for anyone to examine. Three grandsons held up pieces of her productive life until the auctioneer got his price. The surgeons had prepared her for all of that. And then she chose charity bingo in a train station, living in a sea of blue and white, eyeglasses reflecting refectory light and talking about all children as though they were seven years old. She shuffles on tough gray carpet past vague oil paintings and pinks and yellows to a wide doorway in a tiled room with a broad window above an empty parking lot. Her beige cell was an echo chamber for a television pointed at a padded chair set diagonally in the far corner. The second tumor was a bullet wound. She fought death for an organ while terror and loneliness carved their faces in the withering bone and then went to live with my brother so as not to die in fields of stone. 
and she endures the small indignities like the lift and wipe off the booster toilet seat. When I hold her up, she puts her arms around my neck and I tell her, we're dancing. I remember her teaching second graders eye to eye, her athletic grace on the basketball court, the golf course, water skis, and now we're doing a spastic dance in a dark hallway with only a lighted door at the end. When all of the televisions are unlistenable and the phone no longer rings, there are only two sounds that matter, breathing and someone calling her name. That would be me. Like a bird on a wire, like a drunk in a midnight choir, I have tried in my way to be free. A broad, burnished face holding soft brown eyes, hands like wood. When we shook, he looked right through me. The 11-year-old next in line held back. What was the point of stepping up to shake some robot's hand? But the kid took a hesitant step when his parents pushed him forward. Two quick jabs, Ali shuffle. The bronze one suddenly burned seven feet tall, fierce and playful, fast, lethal, and laughing. The kid would have fallen over backwards if his parents hadn't caught him. Ali smiled, slowed, shook a hand and sank back into himself. Mr. Ali, what was the most important thing you ever did? Change my name. A car salesman named Muhammad Ali tells me it's a very common name. Well, Michael Brown wrote the book on the Love Canal. Michael Brown owns the Bengals, coaches the Cavaliers. He pitched for the Giants. Michael Brown can be a composer, a physicist, he can sell Labatt's beer across Canada. Michael Brown is the guy who screwed up FEMA after Katrina. Michael Brown can be anybody. But even if I changed my name, I couldn't be Muhammad Ali. It bothers me when we look at him like Han Solo's frozen in that Star Wars movie, alive, but not quite. So easy to defeat. Sonny Liston thought that once. Smokin' Joe did twice. Foreman had him beat before the fight. Nixon had him down until he was out. Now, who's left standing in the center of the world? Yeah, Parkinson's has him on the ropes, but it's rope-a-dope time again. Using immobility to wear his opponent down and countering with those brief flurries of punches that mostly kids see. If we start thinking once again, yeah, he was the greatest, but he couldn't beat any of these brash young kids with the loose lips who expect to find their names in the history books. Just when you've about counted him out, a tiger will rise up and throw those huge wooden paws in your eyes, your own ease arrested by all of that passion, your own name meaningless next to his. He's stoked by a fire in his belly that flares again and again in quiet beauty. I am the greatest. I am the greatest. With a fire like that, using a torch to light the Olympic flame was merely being polite. <laughs> Who's going to notice when your flame goes out? There are children of the darkness. There are children of the sun. You may see the sons of daylight, sons of night are seen by none. At first, it's like standing below Mount Rushmore with huge immobile faces above. And then the pinch and the penetration of the Novocaine flips the relationship. And I sit stone-faced, and like Borglum and his crew, they put on gloves and goggles and set to work with picks and drills. Metal screams against rock solids. Fine spray halos the air. I'm Teddy Roosevelt with a rigor mortar smile, a cutter just below my eyelid, eccentric were carving my teeth. I sit in the immobilizing chair, lights and armatures angled away, but ready at hand. I don't need that inevitable dalmier on the wall, that happy tooth brushing his moronic top, reruns of Marathon Man. 
In my hometown, we had two dentists. Doc, Doc Meyer stood on my chest, laid on the tongs, and pulled. When I survived, I got a shot of whiskey. <laughs> Doc Broccoli never hurt anybody. He's the reason I'm here every day this week. Hard things need hard ways. And so while the metal screams inside my skull and the water runs down my face and bits of tooth arc away from the excavation, I try to find my favorite drill. The high wine of the fine grade shrinks me when friction turns to burning. The coarse irregular one suits my style, but I think it gouges out too much. The tongue exaggerates everything. And so I zone out to the mosquito buzz inside my ear, bubbling water, one-sided conversations, the clank of stainless steel on glass until a drop forge forces an inlay into a cauterized root canal. Rinse, says the dental tech. And blood and calculus swirl down the drain like the end of a shower at the Bates Motel. And those of us who survive stare in stupefaction at the high cost of crude work to fix a failed body part and then go to lunch to chew on our tongues while behind in the dark torture chambers we pray that rich dentists are contemplating suicide. It's so easy to dream of the days gone by. It's so hard to think of the times to come. But the grace to accept every moment as a gift is a gift that is given to some. What can you do with your days but work and hope? Let your dreams bind your work to your play. What can you do with each moment of your life but love till you've loved it away? Six times eight is 48. Do you remember the first time you heard that? The presence of all light is white. The presence of all color is black. Do you remember the first time you heard those elementary artistic principles? Had I not loved Rome more? Do you remember the first time you heard that? Mm. The first time you heard those things, you heard them from me. Doc Brown, Professor Brown, Old Man Brown, your teacher. And you don't remember? Am I faded now like the cloudy corner of some chalkboard or the grain in the desktop where all you can remember are Artie Moran's initials carved up in the corner? I remember you. I remember all of you. For me, it's like standing at the top of some low summer hill with all of the wildflowers of the season dancing in the sunlight. There, Sarah Cobes, bright-eyed Daisy, best poet I ever taught. And Wilma Campbell, tough stalk, black-eyed Susan, who came out on cold Philadelphia nights to get her education. Al Schultz, high school wrestler, tunnel rat, the first one of mine to be on that wall in Washington. Now, it's not the big city politicians and the mass murderers we teachers remember. Their lives were set before we met them. It's the ones who come from the community, who want to make something of themselves, who want to give something back. You're the ones we work with. You're the ones. We remember. I look back and I see you there. Prime numbers, primary colors, premier poets. So proud, so proud. Even I can almost feel it. But you know, we teachers are not fools about this. When somebody comes into my office after a three-week absence, sits in the empty chair and says by way of explanation that he is a paranoid schizophrenic and spring is difficult for him, I say, what kind of crap is that? I'm a manic depressive and it's hard for me all year round. <laughs> On sunny days, there's too much wind. The snow is beautiful, but it's cold and hard to drive in. Every friend I've got has screwed up sooner or later. Every lover I ever married turned out to be a wife. And let's not blame it on the drugs. I'm not on yours and you won't do mine. <laughs> Thorazine turns me into a zombie. Lithium screws up my natural rune. Xanax turns me into a presidential cowboy. Look at all the beautiful explosions way out there somewhere. Booze doesn't help. Every time I get drunk, I remember everything that happened the last time I got drunk. So, you might think you're some kind of psychotic Billy the Kid who can terrorize everybody in this town, but I'm Sheriff Pat Garrett and this is my territory. 
When I am manic, I will enjoy putting the screws to you. And when I am depressive, I will do a thorough job. So you better get to work, kids, because nobody rides out of here uneducated. I am. I am the eternal procrastinator. I wonder if there is a greater being. I hear the oppressive silence of lies. I see my soul being bared through poetry. I want people to realize their true potential. I am the eternal procrastinator. I pretend words don't hurt. I feel saddened by the greedy wealthy. I touch others' feelings carefully. I worry that self-consciousness will be my downfall. I cry for the prejudiced. I am the eternal procrastinator. I understand world peace doesn't exist. I say what is on my mind thoughtfully. I dream intolerance is obliterated. I try to put others before myself. I hope people will reform for their children. I am the eternal procrastinator. You have to look your best, and I'm the only one sometimes who tells them they are beautiful, and they are for 20 minutes in my chair. I pump them up, throw on the cape, and cut. I always cut more than they ask for. They'll thank me two weeks from now when it starts to grow in. I take away the mouse, duff, dinge, and give them back the color they once knew or the color they always imagined, if only they were different. I curl it, straighten it, frizz it, foil it, or kiss it with sunshine, but cutting is what I do best. Trim, feather, layer, wedge, buzz it, whatever she wants. I take away the ugly parts, the split ends and tired die, the mortgage, the kids, the long hours on the swing shift at the nursing home wiping someone's grandma's butt, the threat of the mill closing, that two-timing husband and not enough grocery money to last the week. They like it when I hold up the mirror and they can see I've got their back. Spring and fall to a young girl. Margaret, are you grieving over Golden Grove, unleaving? Leaves like things of man you with your fresh thoughts care for, can you? As your heart grows older, you will come to such sights colder by and by nor spare a sigh the world of one would leave me alive yet you will weep and Sorrow's springs are all the same Nor mouth had known or mind expressed What heart heard of Ghosts guessed It is the blight that man was born for It is Margaret It 
is the blight that man was born for It is Margaret You mourn Music is a strange and useless thing. It doesn't offer cover from the storm. It doesn't really ease the sting of living, nor nourish us, nor keep us warm. And men expend their lives in search of sound, learning how to juggle bits of noise, and by their swift illusions to confound the heart with fleeting and evasive joys. Yet I am full of quaking gratitude that this exalted folly still exists. That in an age of cold computer mood, a piper still can whistle in the mists. His notes are pebbles falling into time. How sweetly mad it is and how sublime.